Dan Esty is the Hill House professor at Yale University with primary appointments in the Yale Environment and Law School and a secondary appointment at the Yale School of Management. He also serves as director of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy and on the advisory board of the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, which he founded in 2006. Professor Esty is the author or editor of 12 books including the prize-winning guide to corporate sustainability, Green to Gold, and dozens of articles on environmental and energy policy. From 1989 to 93, Professor Esty served in a number of senior positions in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where he led the EPA's regulatory review process and helped negotiate the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. From 2011 to 2014, he served as Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, where he led efforts to draft Connecticut's first energy strategy, launch a green bank to promote clean energy, and restructure the state's regulatory programs. ST has also provided energy advice to companies, governments, international organizations, NGOs, and foundations around the world. ST's newest book, A Better Planet, 40 Big Ideas for a Sustainable Future, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dan ST. Megan, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. It's a, a great pleasure to have you here, and I look forward to really making this a conversation. So I, I'm going to start with some thoughts, maybe even some provocative thoughts and then uh, try to move fairly quickly to a back and forth. And so I am eager to hear how you see the issues we're talking about, and frankly, to uh, dig into what I think is a pretty tough topic in some regards. But I want to also be provocative uh, and push thinking a little bit. So I'm going to start with the suggestion that it's a great moment to gather to talk about the sustainability of our planet. Now, I hear a few snickers already. Um, it could be seen by others as a not very good moment, as an inauspicious rather than auspicious moment. Um, and there are signs of worry. Uh, the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement seems to be under some threat. Uh, the President of the United States, as you probably know, has uh, suggested the U.S. will pull out of this agreement. I hope you all know that the U.S. has not pulled out, though. You all do know that, right? Under the terms of the agreement, the U.S. can't pull out uh, until, ironically, the day after the election in November. So whether the United States actually leaves this Paris Agreement or not remains in doubt. And, um, you know, it, it is possible the U.S. won't depart. Uh, of course, there are other worrisome signs. The clean power plan that was put together by the Obama administration as the way the U.S. would implement its commitment to the Paris greenhouse gas emissions control strategy uh, is, has been pulled back and a much weaker version has been put forward. Uh, just this last couple of weeks, the Trump administration has decided to narrow the protection of water across the country through a narrowing of something called the Waters of the United States rule, basically uh, pulling back from protecting anything short in many regards of a navigable waterway. And it's also pulled back on the mercury and air toxic standards that were implemented just a, a few years ago. Uh, it's pulled back on the methane control standards that were adopted near the end of the Obama administration. And the list goes on. So you could say, tough moment. But here's what I would say. It's a gift to the world that cares about the environment. And in particular, it's a reminder that we can't be complacent. And frankly, that the status quo, the way we were doing things, up until the last few years isn't good enough. Uh, and not everything the Trump administration has critiqued is wrong. Uh, our 20th century approach to environmental protection, which we're still stuck with in many regards, uh, didn't go far enough in some cases, was in other cases not as well structured or as well framed as it could be, was too slow, too expensive, led to too much litigation, and frankly didn't deliver all that it needed to at an acceptable cost to many people. So we have, I think, a, uh, a shot across the bow, a reminder that we must continue to refine and reform and improve our strategy of environmental protection. And there is a big debate about what the most important finding in social science of the last couple of decades or the last, let's say, 50 years might be. 
but I'm going to offer you a possibility. And that is that the most critical thing to the health of any organization, businesses for sure, government entities as well, policy programs as, as well, is the importance of constant innovation. And we have not, in our environmental arena, innovated very much at all for at least 30 years. I take us back in that regard to the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments as the last time something significant was done to sharpen our environmental program in the United States of America. So we have gone now more than a generation without any significant tightening up, reframing, improving, bringing on board the new technologies of the last 30 years into our efforts at environmental protection, land conservation, energy efficiency, and so on. So I think we have a, a really good moment to step back and ask, what is it we should be doing? How do we ensure that our environmental programs are delivering all that they could and should. And I would argue, if you would like, that the moment of opportunity is going to arrive in April. I hope all of you are focused on and preparing your own celebrations in support of the 50th anniversary of the original 1970 Earth Day. Are all of you getting ready for that uh, special moment? Uh, and I urge those who can, and I'm one of the ones who can in this room, to think back in where you were in April of 1970, when for the first time, really, 20 million Americans went to the streets in various protests and marches and teach-ins on the importance of the environment. And I think it started a movement that continues to this day, in which we concluded at that time that the importance of the natural world had been underattended to. And I think it's a, a good moment to take up that reminder again. So I hope all of you will be thinking about this. And here's what I would propose to start that conversation with. We do need to take our game up a notch or two. Uh, there are some issues that we have done very well on over the past 50 years. The air across the country is much better quality than it was. Our waters are, in many cases, much better protected. Most people, not all, most people have safe drinking water. We have a reasonably good program of waste collection, a little less good at handling of hazardous waste, but not terrible. We do have a program of chemical management, ensuring much less in the way of chemical exposure than people were subjected to two generations ago. So we have made progress, but we also know that our 20th century approach to environmental protection can and should be taken up to a higher level. And here's what I think we now know. That 20th century approach focused very heavily on federal government action. In fact, it wasn't just heavily. In some regards, it set the EPA up as the doer of all things environmental. And it made sense in 1970. We didn't know much about environmental protection. We didn't really have good ecological science. We didn't have much epidemiological science. We didn't know how the flow of pollutants across the land and through the water and in the air affected us. In fact, we didn't even have very good mapping of that flow of emissions, of what we sometimes call the fate and transport of those harms. Uh, today, we know much more. We have a big base of science. So it made sense, 1970 into the 80s, to charter an EPA. By the way, 50th anniversary of the EPA later this year get an EPA up and running, send it off to figure out what to do, and it did. And again, it did a lot of good things. It sorted out a lot of issues, figured out what the big harms were, helped us begin to map those, and, and this was the core of our 20th century approach, had thousands of engineers working, both at the EPA and regional laboratories and offices across the country, looking industry by industry at what could be done to reduce harm and developing, and this is the core of our environmental law framework in America, a definition for each industry of best available technology that should be adopted and would be required by law to be followed. And that's what we've done. And again, we've made progress, but it was kind of heavy-handed. It involved a lot of government mandates. Uh, it was once a, uh, a technology was chosen, kind of a lock-in effect took hold, little incentive for innovation. It was costly in many regards, and almost always the industry sued to say, oh, no, no, this is too much burden. Uh, so it was slow. It took years, sometimes even decades, to sort out 
uh, whether the standards would hold. So I think we do have a chance to do things now in a, a better way with the technologies and the knowledge that we've acquired in the intervening decades. And here at one of the centers of our information revolution of the last three decades, uh, it might be argued that the environmental arena is the least touched segment of society when it comes to information technology, the internet, communications breakthroughs uh, of recent times. You know, almost every other element of society has been completely remade in the last 20 or 30 years. You know, no baseball team today chooses players the way they did 30 years ago. Some of you will remember that. The old scouts chewing tobacco, going out and saying, well, that guy's got it, and that one he doesn't. But intuition is important still, but on top of data. And people that rely on best guesses without data, I think are systematically underperforming against those that have data foundations for their choices. And of course, no business today markets or sells the way it did 30 years ago. Business as well has been transformed by big data, the ability to micro-target advertising, and really completely reframing how companies put goods in front of the people they're trying to sell them to. So we do need to think about how we bring the information revolution to bear in the environmental arena. We do need to recognize the broader capacity we have today so we don't have to leave everything to Washington, uh, in that case being Washington, D.C. Uh, we have the ability to be more bottom-up and not just top-down, to really engage, as I think we have seen leadership in, uh, recognizing what states can do, governors can do, mayors can do, and frankly, some of the most important breakthroughs in environmental protection in recent years have been at that state and local level. Uh, I salute the governor of Washington, Governor Inslee, for what he has done to bring the issue of climate change into our political year. I think, although he isn't even a candidate now, he did a great deal to ensure that all of the remaining Democrats, at least, are talking about climate change, developing plans, arguing about how we take on this challenge. I think it's also the case, and this is important to step back and reflect on, that the role of various actors in society when it comes to environmental harms has changed, changed dramatically in some cases. Uh, when you think about what we did uh, and what was kind of the structure of environmental policy and environmental problem solving uh, in the 20th century, business was seen as the problem, the source of the issues that had to be addressed. In the 21st century, there are still problems from business. But we also know now that many companies are stepping up to the challenge of helping us deliver a more sustainable future. And I think the challenge is not that government goes away, but can government reframe policy to get business to do more? Of course, continuing to push those that are polluting and not step stepping up to responsibilities, but inviting those that might actually help us solve problems to do so. And I think the case can be made that if innovation is the critical element of successful organizations, the environmental arena needs a big injection of innovation. And I think that has to come from every segment of society, and I hope we can remake environmental protection in the next decade in a way that is much better at capturing the innovation capacity of the country, the world beyond, and particularly with the framing of incentives to ensure that the companies that are doing so much to transform life in other arenas bring some of that capacity for transformative change to bear in the environmental realm. Now, I think it's also important to notice that individuals are playing a very different role environmentally today than they might have 50 years ago. 50 years ago, I think most people thought their number one environmental responsibility was to vote. And that reflected that 20th century view that the key actor was the government, particularly the federal government, and the way you shaped it was to send representatives that would push the federal government's regulatory program uh, in the direction that you wanted. Now, there were non-governmental organizations formed, and they, too, focused on leaning on the government, particularly the federal government. I think this has changed. Uh, NGOs are increasingly doing many more things, demonstrating solutions, working with businesses, uh, organizing people to 
be heard. But individuals have an even more important transformation in their role today. And I would argue that we are all not just voters now, we are consumers with the potential to be green consumers and to use our buying power to shape what's available in the marketplace. And I think we do see that where people stand up and demand better alternatives, uh, companies will respond. And if the companies that are the current providers of a product or a service don't respond, somebody will come in and out-innovate them and bring a better product to the marketplace. And I think the world is shocked at the market value of Tesla, bigger than all the rest of the automakers combined. How is that so? And the answer is they're innovating. By the way, I'm not sure Tesla makes it in the end as a car company, but I think it will be a big success as a battery company, as an energy storage company, as a car design company, as a company that helps create the mobility options of the future. So it's interesting to see the, the market wisdom is that this is a business and a leader, Elon Musk, who's doing creative and interesting things. And a lot of people think that's going to pay off, at least in some way, over time. So I think individuals can help steer the market with their purchases. And for many people in this room, a further role that you all will play and can play today is as investors. A growing number of individuals are starting to ask their financial advisors, how are my companies in my portfolio doing from a sustainability point of view? And frankly, if your investment advisor can't answer that question, you need a new one. Because having some degree of alignment, perhaps an ever greater degree of alignment between your own values, your own preferences, including preferences perhaps for environmental protection or action on climate change, it's not an unreasonable thing to ask and to ensure that your portfolio is aligned with those values. And that, by the way, has led to one of the other big breakthroughs of the last few years, which is a focus now on, as part of our data-informed world, environmental, social, and governance metrics that are increasingly being developed to gauge which companies are helping us move towards a sustainable future and which, frankly, are obstacles. And you should increasingly be able to uh, get rid of those companies that you feel are, are misaligned with where you'd like the world to go. And of course, every individual today, everyone at least carrying a cell phone, which is almost everyone, is a potential watchdog. So there are everyday stories coming out where somebody has captured a company misbehaving, and in sometimes environmentally misbehaving, dumping things it shouldn't dump, polluting in places it shouldn't pollute. And that, I think, is also an opportunity to ensure that we don't wait for the EPA to catch up with them. We can now capture misbehavior uh, and call it to account and ensure that it's much tougher to get away with the kind of harm causing that used to be normal. Now, I think it's also important to recognize that there's a new set of science realities that help strengthen our foundation for remaking environmental protection for the 21st century. And the Better Planet book that I hope some of you will pick up and, and find of value um, has a number of essays that try to talk this through. Uh, Oz Schmitz, my colleague at Yale, has written the first essay in the book. And he points out that the single most important finding in ecological science over the last 30 years is to reflect the interconnectedness of everything. So life on this planet turns out to be much more deeply intertwined than we understood. And that, in fact, calls out a pretty serious structural mistake with 20th century environmental protection, where we broke down problems into silos by, in most cases, environmental media. So we have specific structures of law and policy around air pollution, separate ones around water, around waste, around chemicals, climate change again off in a corner. Um, that reflected our 20th century need to break problems apart, to try to get our arms around them and make sense of it. 21st century, we need to put it back together. We need integrated solutions that reinforce and not, don't undermine other parts of the environmental challenge. So we need, in fact, uh, a rebuilt system that is much more systems-oriented. And again, a couple of my Yale colleagues, uh, Paul Anastas and Julie Zimmerman, have written a beautiful essay on the importance of systems design, systems thinking, 
and frankly, an integrated response to our environmental challenges. I think we also have started to see a, a set of new values appear, values that will inform how we might remake our environmental protection efforts. And number one on that list, and I think we see it in the conversation now every day, is an intergenerational change in view from the world of the 1970s and 80s where people thought that environmental harm was the inevitable byproduct of economic activity, of industrialization, frankly, of economic success. I don't think young people believe that, and I think they're right. It is not necessary to have the kind of pollution that we have seen over the last 50 years in order to have a successful economy. And I think every time Greta stands up and yells at people for not having done more to stop climate change, she is a reminder that these old assumptions should be challenged. And that going forward, we can have an assumption of no pollution as the starting point. And I think, in fact, when we reorganize, as I hope we will over the next decade, the starting point will be to use the frame that an economist might offer, a principle of no externalities. So again, the 20th century, companies thought it was normal and their business models sometimes were built on putting some amount of harm up a smokestack, out an effluent pipeline, in effect externalizing costs onto society as a whole. And those externalities were in large measure not paid for. Uh, in fact, the EPA would give people permits, literally permitting them to emit a certain amount of harm. I think uh, that strategy uh, has delivered some benefits, but not, is not good enough for the 21st century. So I think we are going to move and, and watch this space unfold to a principle of no externalities. Not that all pollution ends, but all pollution for free is going to end. Uh, so companies that are polluting today are going to be asked to either stop the harm or pay for the harm. And that is going to have transformative effects because there are some companies that I'm not sure can remake their business model for that changed starting point, that changed assumption. And by the way, similarly, that if your business model depends on extracting resources from public spaces, public places, whether that's water from a nearby river or depending on grazing land that you're given on a government lease, that too will have to be fully paid for in this world of no externalities. And I think some companies are prepared for that transformation, others are not. Now what else does the change in assumptions going to bring us? What else can we anticipate? I think this year we can see some of this breaking wave of new expectations, new assumptions uh, coming at us with quite a, a force and speed. Uh, I think a world of no externalities is also a world where people assume that waste can be brought to an end. So I think we're headed for, if not a world of entirely zero waste, at least a target of zero waste. And what does that mean? That means that and this is a, a hometown issue for this uh, city of Seattle in some regards, that all the packages that show up at our door wrapped in bundles of plastic um, need to be rethought. Uh, the e-commerce world that is, again, transformative and giving us access to almost anything at any time, including, by the way, the Better Planet book that can be delivered overnight <laughs> anywhere in the country, but wrapped, I have to tell you, sadly, in a, it's in a big box and wrapped in all kinds of plastic, um, and it is not going to be okay going forward. So I think you're going to see a big push for people who are in the world of particularly packaged goods to move away from things that can't be reused or recycled or, at the end of life, composted. So again, plastic is under huge attack this year. I think you're going to see a big push towards fiber-based packaging, uh, which can be, in some cases, reused, uh, in almost all cases, recycled. And frankly, over time, as it becomes less recyclable, it can be broken down and composted. Uh, and that's a better model, particularly in the world of sustainable forests and sustainable forestry, which we now have really a, a good set of understandings of. Again, a nice essay in the Better Planet book about how much we've learned about how to manage forests. So 25 years ago, we might have been worried about leaning more heavily 
on forest products companies, again, a hometown issue for the city of Seattle. But today I'm not worried. The, the major forest producers are really pretty good at sustainable management of our forests. And if anything, forests are going to turn out to be a critical part of the answer to climate change. We are going to need to plant a lot more trees. And by the way, this is something that even our president has rallied to. So there are elements of this agenda that I think can move on a bipartisan basis. And I want to come back to that as well, because I do think that one of the things that we need to worry about is how the environmental agenda has become a very partisan battleground. And I will tell you that it's my observation, having spent a, a career studying environmental progress and studying how transformative change occurs, uh, one critical observation is it never occurs on a one-party basis. Never. Because the American structure of politics is designed to have political leadership swing from one side to the other. And if transformative change was achieved by one party shoving it down the throat of the other, as soon as the pendulum goes the other way, the party that felt it took it unfairly is going to dismantle what was done. And we have seen that happen time and time again. The only way to deliver transformative change is, and this is counterintuitive and jarring, I have to tell you to my students at Yale, jarring, the only way to deliver transformative change is up the middle. The strategy for change in America has to be getting 70% of the public and the political leadership with you. It turns out that anything less than that leaves you vulnerable to pendulum swing with the next political cycle and the wipeout of your change. So this again is the core message of the day, jarring to some. Transformative change is almost always slow, not fast, and it is always up the middle. So this is a, a political lesson I hope some people will absorb. And I think it isn't to say that we aren't thinking new thoughts, working to be big in our ambitions. The title of this book is Big Ideas, but it turns out that big ideas have to be thought through in implementation in very careful ways. So one of the things I think we now recognize is that we're going to have to be more careful about some things that we didn't pay attention to in the 20th century. And let me cite a couple of them. First of all, there was so much focus on getting the environment taken care of, we in some cases in doing environmental protection lost sight of the people who we were trying to protect the environment for. So a major issue, again, several essays in this book that I think are really inspiring, a major issue now on environmental justice. What's fair? And that has several dimensions itself. Of course, there's a critical question about who bears the burden of pollution that is not addressed. The children of Flint, Michigan are an example, but there are other communities as well. So unabated pollution harm, serious environmental justice issue, and one that has to be taken much more account of. But there's a second flip side to this, which is who pays for environmental change? Who pays when we step up our environmental game and have to invest more and perhaps make people pay for the harm they're causing, which is what that end of externalities implies? And I think this brings us to another critical issue. I think it turns out that there is very little appetite in the Republican Party for more government mandates. So if you want transformative change on the environment, you've got to figure out how to get, if not all the Republicans, some significant percent, half maybe. And that is going to require a different strategy, almost certainly a strategy of moving away from our 20th century approach of command and control regulation to much greater use of market mechanisms making people pay for the harm they cause, putting a price on emissions. And some people would say, well, that's so difficult. How would it ever happen? It actually turns out it's a 500-year-old tradition in Anglo-American law. Uh, going back to before the United States was even here, our British forebears had a legal framework that said if you cause a nuisance, you can go to court, and the court will order your neighbor who's causing a problem or whoever to either stop the harm or to pay for it. And that's the principle we're going to have to restore. Stop the harm or pay for it. 
And I think that is the direction that we're seeing uh, movement now. And frankly, I think the promising element of the conversation here tonight, or at least my offer of a provocative starting point, is I think Republicans are going to rally to that position. Uh, not all, and maybe not our current president, but over the next decade, you're going to see a lot of Republicans say, you know, it wasn't the science of climate change I was doubtful about. It was the policy implications of the science of climate change. And I think uh, that, to unpack it for a moment, is the fear that if there really is a greenhouse gas emissions problem, that the old answer, and I say old answer, 20th century answer that's been carried forward even though we're two decades into the 21st century, has been the government will tell us what to do, we're going to have to accept significant limitations on individual choice, business choice, and we're going to have mandates that direct us in our behavior. And I think that is very hard for Republicans to accept given their core focus on liberty, on choice, on freedom. So a successful agenda on sustainability broadly, climate change in particular, has to bring Republicans into the conversation, has to win their support in large numbers, and I think it's going to be easier to do with a price signal and a market mechanism than the old answers that have previously been used. I think a second thing we're going to have to pay attention to is the transition strategy, how we get from where we are to where we need to be. And I think in the 20th century, we have underattended to who is jarred, who is disrupted when policy change comes about. And I think there has been way too little time and attention paid to who is going to have to shift gears in significant ways and may not feel good about that and may, in fact, then resist uh, this push towards a transformed energy future for society at the very least, uh, but perhaps more broadly, the kind of changes required for a sustainable future. And I want to identify three communities that I think need to be the center of our policy framework as we develop it over the next couple of years to get serious about climate change. And I would say only one and a half of these have been attended to. So community number one that we have to pay attention to are the fossil fuel economies that exist out across our country. We could call this the West Virginia problem. And I think it is uh, an important question of how we get the folks in West Virginia not to just resist to the end uh, the transformation to a decarbonized future. And decarbonization, in case I need to translate that, means we are not going to burn coal. Uh, no more coal burning in this country. It's already the case that coal is in steep decline as an energy source. But it also means that West Virginia is economically distressed. And the answers up till now of saying, well, let's send in the computer programmers to retrain the coal miners, it's not serious. So we need a serious strategy for fossil fuel dependent economies and communities. Number two, uh, a community that's gotten half an answer. And that is, there are a whole lot of folks whose budgets are so close to the bone that they just can't imagine having to pay more for anything. And if you say, well, we're going to make you pay for the harm you cause, and when you burn fossil fuels and put gas in your car, uh, you're causing greenhouse gas emissions, and we're going to make you pay for those, these folks will say, I can't do it. I'm already stressed and strained enough in my family circumstances. Uh, and I think that's a, an issue that's got to be taken seriously. Uh, if you don't, you end up as uh, President Macron has found in France, uh, with his gilet jaune, the yellow vest people, uh, protesting in the streets. Uh, and those are not city folks in Paris, those are folks from the countryside who have said, uh, my budget is tough, I can't do more. And that brings me really to the third category of folks who I think need to be taken more seriously, and that is rural America. And it happens to overlap with red state America. And getting a majority to move towards transformative action requires that we be much more serious about the reality that rural America is more carbon intensive in its lifestyle than city America. And we've got to make sure that the folks in those places that need to be brought into the coalition for action are made to feel that their lives will not be worse as we get serious about climate change. I also think we've got to change the conversation. We're going to have to bring in people who might be supportive of this, but don't know it because they feel left out of the discussion. 
And I would say in that regard, the essay in this book uh, by my colleague at Yale, Thomas Easley, is enormously interesting. Uh, Thomas is a dean at Yale for inclusion and diversity, but he is also a hip hop artist. And he has a beautiful essay, and as the editor of a book with 40 essays, I'm not allowed to have a favorite, just as no parent can have a favorite child. But I would point you to Thomas Easley's essay <laughs> as particularly interesting, and I, I would say compelling. Um, what he is arguing is that if you want to get inner city communities uh, to pay attention to climate change and, and issues of the environment, you need to bring the conversation to those folks on their terms, not expect them to come to the environmentalists' conversation uh, of the kind we're having here tonight. And he is completely correct. So he does hip-hop songs that kind of tell the story of the environment, of climate change, of the importance of forests uh, in a very different way, and a way that is going to engage communities that I probably can never talk to, or certainly never as compellingly as he can. So new conversations, new communications, also going to be absolutely essential. And I started to say before, and let me come back one more moment to this critical idea that our strategy going forward needs to put innovation much more front and center. Uh, we really do need to find ways to make our push towards an environmental future, a sustainable future, a transformed energy future seem attractive and not burdensome. Almost all transformations promise people at the end something better, not something worse. And I think there has been a sense that, and this is partly, again, I think the framing of our environmental friends, um, that we are going to have to sacrifice to get where we need to go. I do not think that's a winning strategy. And I think it is not a winning strategy in America, and it is not a winning strategy across the world. And as we know, environmental protection is now interconnected in profound ways. Climate change in particular, those greenhouse gases blanket the earth. And even if deeply counterfactually, the United States were to end all of its emissions tomorrow, with the rest of the world continuing to pump those greenhouse gases out, we are not protected. So this has to be solved globally and not just nationally. And I do think we need a strategy that shifts gears to really trying to give us stronger, better environmental protection that is cheaper, faster, and easier to implement. And the key there will be innovation. Uh, and the fundamental key to climate change is not more treaties, not more laws, not more regulations, but it is a breakthrough in the cost of clean energy. The game is won when some alternative energy source, some renewable power, clean and renewable energy source, comes in under the price of fossil fuel burning. At that point, markets will drive lots of change. There will not need to be dictates to get people to move to that new energy source. Everyone will go to it because it is cheaper, cleaner, more reliable, and fundamentally better. And that is what success is going to look like. So my own essay in this book is entitled Red Lights to Green Lights, and it calls out, again, one of the flaws, I think, of the 20th century approach to environmental protection, which is that we centered our structure largely on telling people what not to do. Don't do that. Red light. Stop. Can't go there. And as everyone who drives a car and comes to a traffic light knows, you have to have not just red lights, but green lights. You need to tell people when to go and where to go. And we have fundamentally and systematically underattended to that in our environmental protection efforts to date. So we got some big things done with red lights. The worst of the pollution stopped just by putting up a big stop sign, big red light. What we haven't done is reinvent our energy system. There was insufficient incentive, green lights, to drive people to invest in transformative change and to bring to bear their creative spirits, their entrepreneurial talents, their innovation capacity, on those critical set of sustainability challenges that we now know we need to put lots of effort into. So the 21st century has to think a lot more about incentives and the flow of investment funds to the critical areas of transformation required for a sustainable future, starting with, and this is a big one, completely transforming our energy system. Now, that seems like a tall order, 
but we've transformed, again, almost every aspect of society with big data, with now machine learning, with artificial intelligence. We've got other capacities with genomics, uh, with the ability to understand each of us as individuals. Uh, and we've got, again, great essays in this book on all of those issues. And, uh, you know, by the way, technology breakthroughs are not always answers. They may bring new problems, again, as the last year has shown. And we have several essays that talk about that. So uh, my colleague Dave Rajeski has written a great essay called There's an App for That, which hints that there's some promise in the tech world for our environmental challenges. But he goes on to say, don't count on this as an easy solution. It's not, and it won't be. But I do think a spirit of innovation in technology, and by the way, not just renewable energy, although breakthroughs in wind power and solar power, and maybe things like wave power or tidal power, or fuel cells and hydrogen would all be helpful. But we need a broader vision of innovation. Uh, innovation that includes the supporting technologies, a smart grid, smart appliances, smart homes, uh, microgrids, decentralized uh, electric power generation, distributed generation. All of these are going to be part of the transformation that's coming. And frankly, we need innovation in how we engage the public. That's why I'm so excited about Thomas Easley bringing in people to this conversation who need to be part of it and need to be part of the transformation who felt left out. And again, innovation in policy, innovation in incentives, innovation in finance. One of the things I found as commissioner of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection in Connecticut was there were a number of people, a lot of people, who wanted to be part of the transition to clean energy but literally couldn't afford it. And they're told, well, there's opportunities. You'd, you know, you'd give them an energy out of their apartment or their home, and you could hand them a list of things to do, and they would say, oh, this all looks great, but I don't have a spare $1,000 burning a hole in my pocket. So in Connecticut, we set up a green bank to provide low-cost loans toward those kind of investments. We're going to need to do that at a much bigger scale across the country uh, and ultimately around the world. And we need green bonds. We need ways to finance some of this out over time because we're going to have to rebuild, fundamentally rebuild, the infrastructure of not just our power system, but of much of our transportation system and, frankly, many of our homes and businesses. All of this is to say the challenge in front of us is big. Transformative change is never easy. There will be no silver bullets. Lots of changes and lots of directions are going to be required, thousands of changes. And as I've suggested, it's uh, fundamentally going to have to be on a bipartisan basis. Uh, otherwise, the transformation will not endure. So I think we have to look out and ask, where's the 70% solution, the pathway forward that can get broad base of support, Democrats and Republicans, lots of independents as well. And uh, my lesson on transformative change, as I hinted at, is that impatience is unhelpful, that fast is slower than steady. And in fact, if we really want change, uh, if you try to do it in a blindingly fast way, you simply get a number of people who will feel jarred by the change fighting you rather than coming on board. So in fact, slow and steady change is faster than fast change. And that's a core principle that I think a lot of people have not taken on board. But I think it's an exciting moment. I think the next year is not going to be the transformative one, but I think the next decade will be. And I'm excited to see it unfold, and I hope some of you, perhaps many of you, will be part of it. Thanks very much. All right, so I'm eager to have your questions, comments, um, return prov provocations, uh, disagreements. And uh, there's a microphone here and another there. So I'm waiting for your questions, but as a law professor, um, I reserve the right, if no one asks a question, to start asking you questions. <laughs> we call that in uh, the teaching of law the Socratic method. In its most uh, tough form, I pick on one person for 10 or 15 minutes and <laughs> quiz them until they break down. All right, we've got a question here. Uh, can I ask two? Um, I think we've got a line, so we're going to give you okay. one, and you okay. can cycle back to the end and try uh, okay, to get sure. another round. Um, so you mentioned uh, talking to our portfolio managers, but what if we invest in index funds? 
I've tried looking for basically like S and P 500 with unsustainable companies filtered out, and it doesn't exist from what I can see. Great question, and you've identified a serious problem in the investment world. First of all, we should all be in in, in these index funds because it turns out to be much cheaper and in the long term much better in in terms of building your portfolio. And what you have to do is keep going until you find somebody that will help you get into um, a portfolio that may not be entirely uh, free of problem companies, but you can find ones that are tilted towards the sustainable companies. But you should keep demanding this and ask. You should write a letter, send emails. Um, and I do think another problem is that the existing data providers, the Bloombergs of the world, the MSCIs, and the Sustainalytics, these are the companies that do sustainability metrics, are not producing very good data. So a lot of the fund managers say, well, I really don't know. I really can't tell you. You know, I wish I had a clearer picture. Uh, and that's not good enough. We are going to need a much better set of sustainability signals about which companies are pulling in the right direction and which are pulling back from where we need to go. So I can't tell you there's an easy answer to what you're looking for, but keep asking. Thanks. From here. Hi, so I hear what you mean with the slow and steady change, but I was wondering um, how slow and how steady, especially when you compare with the rate of extinction and the rising ocean temperatures. Um, and so- it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. And the answer is um, we need to move quickly. We've wasted quite a lot of time since we began to address this problem. Um, and I think the, you know, having been one of the negotiators of the 1992 framework convention, I thought we had the problem solved in 1992. I actually left the government the next year thinking, well, I can go be a professor now. And 20 years later, it turned out, of course, we had seen emissions rise, not fall. So we do need to be tough about making sure we're on a trajectory that will achieve results. And I think there is a need for urgency. But the most successful programs are ones that are slow and steady. And I think the, uh, the truth is we have seen that uh, when the change was too jarring to large parts of the political spectrum, they stopped it. And uh, that's what we have to worry about. So I think the evidence is overwhelming. And again, I defy those that would like to go faster to give any examples where that's worked. They just don't exist. But it's a good question. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to press hard. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't be pushing for the biggest, fastest breakthroughs possible. It just means I think the bottom line, the test here, is how fast can you go and still keep 70% of the public with you? That's the core test. Thanks. Uh, so I just get my friend here because I wanted to ask a follow-up question, which wasn't my actual question. Um, <laughs> sort of That's all right. related to what you just said because, so I found, a, found two of those things to be quite um, interesting. One being that you said 20 years ago in 1992 you thought you had a solution and now you're presenting more solutions to us now. So how can we trust that you're right now 20 years later? <laughs> Other than experience. Fair point. Other than experience, I assume that's right, uh, that that's what it is. Um, the biggest question, um, or rather point, I guess, which isn't, she said not to ask. So let's that. answer the first question first. So okay. um, I think the answer that, and I was not alone, of course, in answering it, uh, that came out in the 1992 Framework Convention was how very smart people in the 20th century thought change would happen. Top down, government setting targets, government telling people what to do, and it didn't work. And I think what we've learned since, and we now have a much better base of knowledge, is that there's a lot of capacity across society that's not in Washington, D.C. Um, it turns out that experimentation across states and cities is critical, and that what you find is a breakthrough in one place that can be replicated and disseminated more broadly. And even more profoundly, it turns out that national leaders, presidents and prime ministers, don't have their hands on the levers of change in many of the regards of what has to be done to decarbonize a society. It's the mayor who runs the transit system and who's much more likely to be able to deliver a good public transit system. It's the governor who does economic development. It's the agriculture commissioner and the farmers who are gonna do sustainable agriculture. So I think we need a, a, a much more bottom up, uh, pull lots of people into the conversation and engage them with incentives to deliver for us as a society. So the other thing you mentioned uh, was that 
you wanted someone to like defy you or whatever to bring up an example of like pushing for change faster than slow and steady. Um, and I'd like, there, you, like you, you are correct in that there's not good examples of that. But the other, I guess, a counterpoint that I would bring up is the civil rights movement. And that during the civil rights movement, we were told, black people were told consistently, time and time again, wait, be slower, don't push so hard, don't do it, don't, don't sit at those counters, don't march down those streets, don't put your body in the lines of the police. We were told that time and time again for generations, and it wasn't until we set up and stood up and said enough and continued to push, even though we didn't have that 70%, but we had five, we had 10%, and we pushed, and we got those changes implemented, so why shouldn't we take examples from people of the civil rights movement, of the Chicanx movement, of the indigenous power movements of the 60s, 70s, and 80s to just push and push and push for change and try to go faster so that we can continue to have that? So that's a good question. The question is, isn't there an alternative model, which is a civil rights model? And here's what I'll tell you. The environmental movement of the 1970s was built on the civil rights model. The people who set it up, Gus Speth and others who set up NRDC and all these enterprises, did it expressly. And read Gus Speth's autobiography, who's a former dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He said, you know, I am doing this with the spirit of the civil rights movement in my heart. Mm -hmm. And what he says now is, that failed. That model did not fail. It uh, did not succeed. And it didn't succeed because it didn't have as clean and clear a moral truth beneath it. Um, and it, it turns out that a lot of people care about a lot of things that are, the that are part of what we get when we get pollution. Mm. People like energy. Mm. They like mobility. They like goods and services. And so if you were telling them that there's a clean and clear line and we have to get rid of all that, and they were willing to go there, you could do it. Hmm. But it's a much more of a challenging balancing act here. Because hmm. here, here's the tough one for you, which I'll push back. If you look at the survey data and ask people, are you willing to give up enormous aspects of modern life hmm. in order to stop climate change? The answer overwhelmingly is no. Hmm that people would rather have their cars, they'd rather have heat in their homes. Mm. And so the answer I come back from that with is, it's innovation. Mm. We have to break the link between thinking that modern life depends on dirty energy mm. and say, no, you don't have to give up modern life. You don't have to give up the things that you've come to value. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have to find another way to get there. Cool. But having said that, I, I wanna applaud the spirit mm. that you're bringing to this. And you heard me say, I, I never, as some people do, dismiss Greta out there pounding mm -hmm. away. I think the insistence that change can happen makes it go faster. Mm. And I think um, some segment of society being willing to throw their bodies on the line, and by the way, my former dean, Gus Speth, has now been arrested, I think, six times. Um, you know, and he tells me that he's, uh, he's you know, ever more frustrated. He started his life in South Carolina, and he tells me he's getting more uh, impatient and he's moving farther north. So he went from a, a being a minister's child in South Carolina to being a head of the Carter Council on Environmental Quality in the White House in That's Washington, cool. set up one of the most important think tanks, the World Resources Institute, then ran the UN Development Program, moving to no north to New York. Then he came to be the dean at Yale, moving north again. Now he's in Vermont. He says, next step, Canada. But I do think um, it's fascinating to see how someone who thought the civil rights model was the right one has mm -hmm. come to believe it's not good enough. Interesting. Um, uh, by the way, he has some very interesting thoughts about what is required. He mm -hmm. now thinks it requires an economic revolution mm -hmm. and a political fundraising revolution. Yeah. So. Interesting. All well, right, thank you. What was you. the book? Uh, his, I, I can't remember the exact name okay. of it, but if you look up Gus Speth, we'll autobiography, brilliant book, Sad book. Yeah. Um, I, I consider him one of the greatest environmental heroes of the 20th century, okay. and his book is written as though his life was a failure. Oh, interesting. So I keep saying to him, slow and steady, you've helped us get a long way, yeah. that you didn't deliver us to the final you know, solution doesn't mean you haven't carried the ball a long way down the field. Cool. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I think there was a moment in your talk where you were sort of making a comment almost in passing where you said uh, that our sort of sentiment has changed around uh, industry and the role it's, it's played and its role moving forward. Um, you mentioned social and economic injustice, uh, the, the idea of moving towards no externalities and other concepts that are related. Um, 
it, the thing is, like, your, your talk is like, sort of sprinkled with optimism, but to be honest, like, I'm quite angry sometimes. And so I found there to be a sort of um, a hole in your talk where you don't talk about keeping the folks um, who have brought us to this point accountable. And when I say folks, I namely mean those in the industry. Um, so could you speak to the role of moving forward with uh, litigation and keeping, um, uh, keeping that as a, a possible outcome? So that's a great question. It's not unrelated to the prior question. Um, and I do think uh, there's an interesting track record here. And um, by the way, this is a, a big issue, and there's an essay in the book on climate change litigation, particularly the young people and the Juliana case that has uh, just been finalized. I, I don't know if you've followed this, but the case was thrown out. So basically, for anyone who is thinking that litigation is the short-term answer, and frankly, it was, by the way, to the civil rights question, it was civil rights litigation that got people moving, uh, even when there was not majority support. I don't think we can wait for the litigation possibility in the United States. Now, having said that, there's other places. The Urgenda case in the Netherlands has transformed how the Dutch are responding to the problem. There's climate change uh, litigation in Ecuador that's changed how that country is looking at these issues. There's climate change uh, litigation in India. So I think in some settings, particularly where, and by the way, many countries have this and we don't, there's a constitutional right to a protection of the environment, you have a foundation for litigation. We are now in a minority of countries that does not have any constitutional protection for nature or a right to the environment. So it leaves us a weaker legal starting point than many other countries. Um, having said that, I do think uh, litigation can draw attention to problem issues. Um, I think sometimes even if you don't win the case, you do win the public opinion. And I think if you look at the, and, and for those who haven't seen it, I think the, the judge's opinion uh, in the Juliana case, the one that just got dismissed, is fascinating because what, here's what the judge, the two judges that argued this had to be dismissed said, the plaintiffs, Juliana and her fellow young people, have made a compelling case that climate change is a problem. But then they said, it's not up to courts to fix it. In this country, you have to get the legislature, the Congress to fix it, and the president. Um, it does, by the way, go to one other point that I jar my students at Yale with, which I'll throw to this audience as well. And I think it's fantastic that the uh, Town Hall Seattle is going to make uh, the programs free for young people. Because I think bringing people into civic dialogue is essential. And my jarring comment is that what demographic group voted in the last presidential election in the lowest numbers? The lowest numbers. What group? 18 to 25. 18 to 25. The lowest numbers. And um, so it is, uh, I think, if you're angry, you should go out and get your friends to register to vote. And by the way, uh, in November, you should, you should chase them down. You should follow them around. You should carry them to the polls. You should get a tandem bicycle and make sure that they're on the back until they've voted. Because this problem will not change until you get people in political leadership who want to make it change. So it's not necessarily the answer you wanted, but I'm afraid it's the answer I'm going to give. Thanks. Please. Thanks for giving the talk, and I admire your work. Uh, I'm not hearing anything about carrying capacity of the earth, not hearing anything about um, why we're setting up our economy in an unsustainable model that eats itself and burns through everything we've got, and I'm not hearing anything about um, uh, why we're producing so many people. So carrying capacity, the overabundance of people, and an economy that's, that's not built sustainably, how, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, you know, I think there are uh, elements of what you're suggesting that are entirely correct, although some of these issues have themselves changed in, in the last number of decades. So the population explosion that was anticipated in the 1970s didn't occur. Um, the threat to the carrying capacity that was forecast by people like Paul Ehrlich proved to be wrong. Um, and I think the, uh, the truth is that innovation outran uh, the seeming inexorable decline of critical resources. And in fact, Paul Ehrlich 
severely misunderstood the capacity to shift gears and move away from things that were in short supply. Having said that, I do think carrying capacity remains a question. I think it's uh, not at the global scale that some had thought, but at particular ecosystems. Uh, and I think the, you know, the more profound point, and I, I started to go down this route in talking about my friend Gus Speth. Um, so Gus Speth, and I think you might agree, has concluded that, the, that capitalism is the problem. Uh, and a model that uh, continues to drive growth is unsustainable. And um, now the debate I have with him is I say, Gus, we have two big things here. One is sustainability and the other is capitalism. If you think sustainability has to first take down capitalism, isn't that just an even bigger lift than trying to move us to a sustainable future? And I argue that sustainability is within reach, the reform of capitalism farther, and that if I have to choose, I'd rather use the economic system we have and remake it. And it's gonna to have to be pretty fundamentally remade. I mean, I'm not saying something small in arguing that every company should pay for the harm it's causing, but I think that's an achievable political goal, whereas the takedown of capitalism strikes me as a very heavy lift. Well, you're, just a quick comment on your... Sure. The first one is, who's gonna set the standards for what is environmental and sustainable, if not an overarching group like the government? Mm -hmm. And second, how about all the harm that's been caused by previous companies that are no longer in business and so on? Who cleans that up? That has always fallen to the government too. So where are we around getting people to pay for it and getting standards set? We, we can't uh, so I, um, no, it's a, all the companies to do it for us. Oh, no, it's a great question. Um, the, the EPA that I envision going forward is not looking industry by industry with a bunch of engineers trying to figure out what the best pollution control technology would be. It's figuring out how much harm is being caused by various emissions and putting a price on it and sending out bills. And, um, you know, I think that is um, going to sharpen companies' focus. There is overwhelming evidence that when you give people a bill to pay, they start to figure out how to reduce it. And by the way, any industry that can't remake itself, somebody else will come in and disrupt it. Uh, and we've seen that happen time and time again. And by the way, contrary to this idea that you know, I was picking on people who, who want a certain kind of change, we do have change that succeeded where we put a price on harm. Chlorofluorocarbons, do you all remember those CFCs that were breaking down the ozone layer? Um, 1990 Clean Air Act, again, this last big legislation I think succeeded, put a rising tax on chlorofluorocarbons. And within five years, the U.S. industry had innovated its way out of every use of chlorofluorocarbons, which included, by the way, tons of things, air conditioning fluid, uh, refrigerators, blowing of styrofoam, aerosols, um, cleaning of many things, solvents. And all of those, dozens of different applications were innovated around. So I think it turns out you make people pay, and especially if you make them pay more and more and more, you can make change happen. And that, again, is my strategy for climate change. $5 per ton starting price uh, per ton of carbon, rising by $5 per ton per year for 20 years. You will, in the short term, allow people who have made things that now look like mistakes not be jarred. They don't have to fight you to the death. But everyone making a new decision, whether it's on a car or a house or a factory or a power plant, sees that end price and says, oh, I guess I better make my decisions based on what I'm going to have to pay out over time. So I think we can drive change faster than people can imagine, slower than some would like, but in a steady enough way that you keep the majority political support you need. So, thanks. Uh, again, I just want to echo other people's statement that the work you're doing is so critically important and we're so grateful for what you're up to. Um, my concern has to do with timing. The solution that you have, the, the approach that you take, is built on working within existing systems and the use of incentives. For example, uh, the approach that you define talks, uh, obviously it requires the emergence of leadership that understands all this kind of stuff. It requires the very slow process of building consensus. It requires the definition of technologies that can make attractive alternatives available to the masses so that you don't have to educate them to the critical dangers that exist, but instead lead them in a, in a consumer-centric economy method. Um, have you modeled the trajectory of that approach towards achieving sustainability? Have you modeled the amount of time that it takes to get to sustainability relative to 
what increasingly, and, and I study the actual scientific literature, so it, for me I'm less surprised, but that is increasingly a problem of the next decade and us having a six foot rise in, in, or maybe a 15 foot rise in water levels in the next decade as opposed to a three foot in a century which is just stoned. So the people that are saying six foot rise in a decade are not saying that that's the likely outcome. No one I've seen says that's likely. They say it's possible. And let me tell you one of the other critical findings of social science in the last few years, that scaring people reduces their willingness to move, doesn't increase it. So it's a profoundly important thing. Again, Dan Kahan, one of my colleagues at Yale, uh, and colleagues uh, at Stanford have done this study over and over again. Fear is not as good a motivator. Some people are motivated by fear, but not the majority, not the vast part of the public. So it turns out that um, the, the extreme science scenarios, which do exist, are important because it could be that we'll hit a very critical place and have discontinuous change that's very severe. But I think the, uh, the truth is that um, the scenarios that I'm talking about are 10, 15, 20 years to transformative change, maybe 30. Um, but if we get there in 20 or 30 years, I think we are still in a place that's recognizable as the planet we've lived in. There will be some degree of climate change. But I think the alternative is to have continued disruption um, of the political system and breakdown in the ability to get anything done. And, you know, I, I look back the last 20 years with some sadness. Um, we had this problem in mind, but we didn't achieve a policy consensus. And as a result, I think we got nothing done. So my goal is to shift from a, a breakdown scenario into a slow and steady scenario. And I don't think it's the optimal. If you told me, you know, you, you get to be the czar of climate change, I would say, okay, we'll make the change happen faster. Um, but I don't get to be the czar. I have to bring along a lot of other people who are, again, hear this point. Many, many people in this country would prefer profound climate change to being told they're going to pay more for gasoline. And so that's the, what we're up against. You have to figure out how to pull those people who would rather, you know, it, they might even, because some of them live in the great heartland, they might even prefer that your coastal zone gets hit with six foot waves. <laughs> they would say, well, those people in Washington state, they're rich, they can fix it. <laughs> we're out in the heartlands, we're not so rich. Uh, we need to drive our pickup trucks. And, you know, I, so I think this is, turns out to be a very, I, I'm not dismissing what you say. I, I'm just saying it's a tough problem. And, you know, I, I have thought about it for 35 years, and I have really come to believe that if we are serious about change, it's going to be the up-the-middle change. And that, that radical transformation, by the way, for those who might have looked up or if you care to, my Wikipedia page, which, of course, somebody wrote about me, just tells, says that I'm a radical centrist. And at first I was jarred by that. I said, a radical centrist, but now I've come to embrace it. <laughs> I think that radical change comes from the center. And this is jarring, again, it is counterintuitive and jarring to a lot of people, but my study of transformative change tells me that that's how you succeed. And I, again, it's a debate I'm willing to have. I'm glad to have people pushing an alternative view, but I am reasonably confident that the empirical evidence across a great number of changes supports my argument that if you want to make change really happen, big change, transformative change, you do better to get on the slow and steady trajectory. So, all right, over here. And I'm going to try to go faster because we have a number of questions and only five minutes to go. Thanks again for being here. Um, you talked earlier about um, individual consumer power. Um, and buying power. Currently, there are very few standards when it comes to environmental products. We've been using the term sustainability, eco-friendly, green. Um, greenwashing is a huge distraction when it comes to just rationalizing our own consumption, particularly in the fashion industry, which is either the second or third most impactful industry in the environment. Do you have any thoughts in terms of possible um, consumer standards where we're at in developing those and who would be the regulatory body in enforcing those standards. So I'm not gonna wait for a regulatory body to get there. I'm gonna have you create an app. <laughs> I'm serious. I think you and, and 10 friends uh, can get together and write up standards and explain how you came up with them, what the scientific foundations are, what the assumptions behind them are, post it online um, and start to guide people. People would love that. 
And I'm more confident that you can get progress going, seriously, you know, you and a few others, than waiting for, you know, the government to figure this out. You know, one of the biggest claims is organic. It took the Department of Agriculture 40 years to come up with a definition of organic. I don't want to wait for that. I want you to figure it out. Just a quick follow-up question. Um, we have H&M and Zara winning sustainability awards in terms of um, fashion industry. Um, they're one of the most impactful right. and companies. Right, fast fashion, and they, you know, it's a terrible model. So I don't know what the app solution for that is if we don't have a legal definition of sustainability. No, you guys write a definition that says, you know, products shouldn't be on a cycle that turns over really fast, and you downgrade people. And so when the folks using your app put up H&M, they're going to see this big red flag that says this is a company that systematically produces clothes that are not sustainable, and here's how we've come up with that answer. And by the way, you'll change people's minds. Okay. You will. Thank you. Thank you. So I really like your idea of building a politically sustainable way of getting to sustainable uh, industry. Uh, and I'm intrigued at this idea of using market standards, which of course I love, this idea of like putting a price on pollution. But I'm not so sure if that's going to be as palatable to our friends across the aisle. Uh, if you think about like Obamacare, which was a market-driven solution to universal health care, they just sort of got rid of that as soon as they came into power. So how, why do you think this would be different for climate change? It's a fair question. Um, I think that the original market-based environmentalism came out of Republican administrations. You know, it was the George H.W. Bush administration that did the acid rain trading program, did that escalating charge on CFCs. So there was a Republican Party that took that seriously and embraced it and developed it. Um, I don't know whether that Republican Party comes back or not. Um, and that's a critical question as well. Um, I, I do think that if, there, if that party of the Bushes were to return, this policy could be there, uh, would be there. Um, I think in the alternative, if you have a party of, uh, of short time frames and, uh, and kind of protecting uh, you know, a, a different set of values, this may be very difficult. So I'm not saying this is easy. I, I really don't think that it is. And I think the political dynamic that overlays it is complicated. But I am not sure that there's a better path forward. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's not. And so I, I put the challenge out to all of you and I take it myself. How do you assemble uh, the political coalition necessary to carry this forward? This is going to be the last question. Our last question. OK, thank you. Great. Puts a heavy burden on the question. Better be a good one, right? Exactly. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I work on salmon recovery here in the Pacific Northwest and in the North Pacific Ocean. And so I'm concerned about climate change from climate change and ocean acidification both. And I think it's urgent. And even small changes could have huge impacts on the resource I work on. So uh, maybe following on the, the previous question, um, I have some concern that we are in a, we've gone through a step function into a different environment in terms of addressing this issue, and that we have a media complex that has become quite comfortable with alternative realities. And there are a large number of people in, in the communities here in the US who buy into those alternative realities. And the, there are drivers in support that are not um, domestic, that there is a global uh, oil and gas industry that is petrified about losing the ability to access the resources that are in the ground. So with the access to the you know, obviously really uh, intelligent and thoughtful people that you talk to, I'm sure in your off hours you sit around and wrestle with this issue. Um, how, how do you see us getting around uh, what might be a complete change in the political landscape here in this country and the, the explosion of media outlets and the uh, willingness of those media outlets to use any method or any amount of truth necessary to achieve their end? So, uh, you know, now we're getting to the really tough issues. I'm glad this is the last question. Um, <laughs> I think you've hit the nail on the head in, with regard to what is the most challenging element here. And that is, I actually think that uh, a debate, a conversation uh, of the kind we're having multiplied a thousand, a hundred thousand times could change people's minds and get 
uh, a 70% solution going, 70% of the people saying we need to make transformative change. But I think there is a risk that in a political system where money is power uh, and where unlimited money can be spent in many circumstances, um, we are at risk of not having uh, the public will actually reflected in political outcomes. And I, I do think, um, to add to the list of changes that you all have to now take up and go home with, uh, Citizens United case is a disaster. Um, and until that's addressed, um, we're at risk of the kind of outcome you're suggesting. And I think the, in the short term, um, those who care about science and data and facts and empirical reality can just need to continue to beat the drum. And I think you should push back every day and say, here's what the science shows. And, and by the way, I would, um, in addition, I'm sure you're doing this, take the lesson to the young people, uh, start the learning in the schools. And um, the, I would tell you, the, uh, when, when I'm in a dark moment, and, and I hope that my views are, are seen as not entirely optimistic. There are some challenges here. Um, but in a dark moment, I think these issues almost always have to change transformatively by generation. And uh, I would tell you that um, spending my days as I do with 20-something students, um, the doubt that climate change is real does not exist very much at all. Uh, all the students, Republicans as well as Democrats, uh, in that younger cohort believe that change has to happen. Um, and I think that they recognize that there are locked in uh, status quo economic interests that will fight them, but they want a planet they can live in. And given healthcare improvements, um, you know, the 20 somethings are going to live to 120. So they, they'll live to see the end of the story here. And I think people who take it seriously, who dig into the science, who look at the data, uh, are with you in thinking that we have to get something done. So let me say thank you to you all. What a lively conversation. Um, I hope you will continue it at home and with your friends. Thank you.